Uh, so as Nick has revealed, this talk is going to be about the many varieties of moral mistake. Okay, so to start, here's a view that's false. The false view says it's always morally blameworthy to fail to appreciate the moral significance, morally relevant non-moral features of an action that one is considering. Now to clarify, by considering here, I mean to include not just thinking practically about whether to perform the action, but also just kind of thinking about it as it were, theoretically, say, because someone else has performed it and you want to evaluate their performance, or because it's part of an interesting thought experiment, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so as I said, this view that it's always morally blameworthy to fail to appreciate the moral significance of morally relevant non-moral facts of an action that one's considering is false. The point of this talk is to show that the view is false and discuss the implications. Here's the plan. You might be thinking, well, that view is obviously false. Why bother to go to all the trouble of giving a whole talk refusing it? Uh, but I suspect that quite a few contemporary philosophers are actually somewhat attracted to the false view. So I'll start by explaining what I think motivates their attraction. Then I'll refute the false view. <laughs> Sorry, guys. And I'll also discuss and refute what I think is a natural modification to the false view suggested by what I say by way of criticism of it. And here in the second and third parts of the talk, I'll just be giving counterexamples. Um, but I'll also try to say some things that suggest that the counterexamples aren't, as it were, isolated cases, but rather instances of more general patterns, so that you guys then have the tools to think up further counterexamples of your own during idle moments, like when you're waiting for the bus or whatever. And then in the fourth and final part of the talk, I'll discuss some um, implications of the falsity of the false view and its modification. And I'll suggest what I think will be interesting directions for future research, kind of inviting you all to join me on my research program. All right, let's get cracking. So why would anyone think that it's always morally blameworthy to fail to appreciate the moral significance of morally relevant non-moral features of an action that one is considering well? Lots of philosophers are interested in whether it excuses wrongdoing for the wrongdoer to falsely believe that her action is permissible. And in the literature, there's already a fairly broad consensus that we should divide that sort of moral mistake, that is, thinking what you're doing is permissible when it is in fact wrong, into two sub-varieties. So for illustration, consider Shakira, Shakira presses a big red button, as you can see. And in fact, let's stipulate this is the wrong thing to do in Shakira's circumstances. And let's stipulate further, it's wrong because it will advance the career of someone who will later use their fame and power to exploit others. Maybe Shakira doesn't know that. Maybe she thinks her pressing the big red button will get a worthy contestant through to the next round of a TV competition and will have no untoward further consequences. In that case, Shakira is mistaken about whether her action, her button pressing is wrong, just because she's mistaken about the actions, morally relevant, non-moral features. In particular, she's mistaken about whether the action even has those features, whether they obtain. Alternatively, maybe Shakira is mistaken about whether her action is wrong, despite being well aware of all of the morally relevant, non-moral features, including those that explain why the action is wrong. Maybe she's mistaken because she incorrectly appraises the moral significance of the non-moral facts of which she is well aware. So in this case, she just doesn't think that the fact that her contestant will use their fame and power to exploit others is a particularly strong reason not to promote their career. Okay, now as far as I know, everyone in the literature agrees that moral mistakes of this first variety can sometimes excuse. But what's more controversial and more interesting is whether the same courtesy should be extended to moral mistakes of the second variety. But to recap, um, if Shakira fails to realize that what she's doing is wrong because of a terrible consequence of which she's innocently unaware, so she mistakenly believes that her act's permissible just because she innocently believes its consequences are going to be limited to certain benign ones, we all agree, well, that could be okay. And the question is, what if she's aware of the terrible consequence or some of the bad feature of her action, but she mistakenly believes that it's not really all that terrible and so her action is still permissible, so she believes. 
question, then does her mistake still serve as an excuse? Some people have quite a strong intuition that the answer to that question is no, of course not. That is, some people have the strong intuition that it can't excuse wrongdoing for the wrongdoer to mistakenly believe that what she's doing is permissible because she incorrectly appraises the moral significance of non-moral features of which she's well aware. But if that's true, it's one of those striking facts that calls out for explanation. So we can ask, why is it true? Why is it that it can't excuse wrongdoing for the wrongdoer to believe that what she's doing is permissible because she incorrectly appraises the moral significance of the morally relevant non-moral features? One possible explanation is that this sort of moral mistake is itself morally blameworthy. And that's an explanation that has some initial plausibility, given that when you think back to those non-moral mistakes, they also seem ill-equipped to excuse if they are themselves blameworthy. So um, if someone's innocently mistaken about some action's terrible consequence, then that seems like it might excuse as we just saw. But if she's negligently mistaken about her action's terrible consequence, perhaps she should have been aware of it and she was remiss in not finding out about it. And it's not as clear that it can excuse her wrongdoing. Here's another example. Oh yeah, quick side note. One thing that bothers me about this literature is that loads of the examples are needlessly brutal. So I've just come up with a nice one about dogs. Um, suppose it's uh, your dog's birthday today and you fail to give your dog cake on its birthday. Whoa, terrible. And suppose you fail to give your dog cake on its birthday because you were mistaken about when your dog's birthday is. Maybe you thought it was, I don't know, sometime in October. You definitely didn't realize that it was today. Uh, March 17th? I think it's the 17th. Okay. Now that might be an innocent mistake. Maybe you adopted your dog, the shelter didn't know exactly when its birthday was, they kind of guessed, and according to their guess, the dog's birthday would be sometime in October. That seems okay. On the contrary, maybe you got your dog from a breeder, and the breeder told you exactly when your dog's birthday is, you've got a certificate about it and everything, but you just failed to encode and preserve that information in your memory because you don't care very much about your dog. In that case, the fact that you're mistaken about when your dog's birthday is, doesn't seem like it's a very good excuse for failing to give your dog cake on its birthday. And it also doesn't look like an innocent mistake. On the contrary, it looks like it's part of the problem, it's just a symptom of your lack of concern for your dog. Okay, so some people think that mistakenly believing that one's action is morally permissible because one incorrectly appraises the moral significance of its non-moral features is like mistakenly believing that it's not your dog's birthday because you don't care about your dog. And so you haven't paid attention to the facts about what its birthday is. That is to say, some people think this sort of moral mistake can't excuse because only innocent mistakes excuse and this sort of mistake can never be innocent. In other words, it's always blameworthy. Maybe that's true. But again, if it is true, it looks like one of those striking facts that calls out for explanation. We can say, all right, maybe it is always itself morally blameworthy to incorrectly appraise the moral significance of your actions, non-moral features, and so come to believe that it's permissible when it is in fact wrong. Why though? Why would that be? Well, one possible explanation of this idea is that in general, incorrect appraisal of the moral significance of morally relevant non-moral features of an action that one is considering is always blameworthy. But that just is the view that I was earlier calling the false view. The false view says that it's always morally blameworthy to fail to appreciate the moral significance of morally relevant non-moral features of an action that one is considering. So if the false view were true, it would explain the truth of the narrower view about mistakenly believing that one's action is permissible when it is in fact wrong, that matches some people's strong intuitions about cases like the Shakira case that we saw earlier. So the narrower view about mistakenly believing that what you're doing is permissible when it is in fact wrong would be explained by its following from this more general principle. 
about the general blameworthiness of incorrect appraisals of the moral significance of morally relevant features of an action that one is considering. Okay, even so, we can still ask why the false view would itself be true. Why would it be true that incorrect appraisal is in general blameworthy? And that's something that some philosophers have started to say a few things about. The person who I find clearest and most explicit is Liz Harmon. Liz Harmon's defended something a bit like the false view in a series of recent papers, and here's how she puts things at one point. So I'm just going to read this block of text. It says, I, Liz Harmon, hold that people who do morally wrong things while caught in the grip of false moral views are blameworthy for their actions and are also blameworthy for their beliefs. They're blameworthy for both their actions and their beliefs for related reasons, because both their actions and their beliefs involve their failing to care adequately about what matters morally. Believing that one's wrong action is morally required involves caring inadequately about the features of one's action that make it morally wrong, because believing that an action is morally wrong on the basis of the features that make it wrong is a way of caring about those features. False moral belief is blameworthy. Okay, so what should we make of this? Well, one thing that is pretty clear is that when Harmon blames you for your wrongdoing, it's not going to do any good to appeal to your mistaken belief that your action was morally permissible, since on her view, that belief is itself morally blameworthy, provided that it's based on a false moral view rather than a mistake about your actions, non-moral features. On her view, to put things differently, as long as you know what you're doing, you're blameworthy if you then fail to realize that the facts about what you're doing of which you are aware are facts that make your action wrong. Quick note, um, here in this block quote, Harmon says uh, morally required. And I was earlier talking about uh, beliefs to the effect that one's action is merely morally permissible. But I promise elsewhere in her writings, Harmon discusses examples of people who merely believe that their wrongful action is permissible. And she says the same thing about those, namely that they're blameworthy for failing to realize that their actions are in fact wrong. So don't worry about that part. Okay, so what's the explanation? Harmon's explanation of why this sort of moral mistake is blameworthy is that it involves caring inadequately about whichever morally significant things in fact make your action wrong. And that's an explanation that looks as though it'll generalize quite broadly to other mistaken appraisals of features moral significance. So the generalized version of the view that Harmon's floating here, which would explain the thing I'm calling the false view, is that correctly appraising a feature's moral significance is a way of caring about it. And incorrectly appraising its significance is a way of caring inadequately about it. Now, my guess is that it's this generalized version of the view that Harmon has in mind when she makes the generic claim at the end of the quote here that false moral belief is blameworthy. Okay. So I haven't found many other people who are as explicit as Harmon, but my sense is that a lot of other philosophers are also attracted to something like this picture. And my sense is that they think that making moral mistakes is a way of being out of touch with moral reality, and that it's being out of touch with moral reality that is fundamentally blameworthy. That's a bit hard to draw on the slides, but I've had a go. So here's moral reality on the left. Here's Shakira again on the right. Just go with that again. <laughs> now, lots of people, including me, think that we can be out of touch with moral reality in a co-native sort of way by uh, failing to be motivated by the things that in fact matter, or by being motivated by things that don't actually matter, or by the strength of our motivations not lining up with their objects' actual relative moral importance. And my sense is that for the philosophers that are attracted to something like the view that I'm calling the false view, there's an additional way of being out of touch with moral reality, a cognitive way, that involves failing to correctly appraise the significance the, sorry, the moral significance of non-moral facts about an action that one's considering. So on views like this, 
It's kind of as though the things that are in fact morally significant call out to us to intellectually appreciate their significance whenever they're present. And I'll come back to that kind of calling out metaphor a bit later in the talk. Okay, so that's my best attempt at explaining why some philosophers like the false view. Check. But unfortunately, the false view is false, and uh, now it's time to see why. Okay, so to start, let's observe that there are many varieties of moral mistake besides believing that your action is permissible or required when it is in fact wrong. You can make a different sort of mistake about your action's deontic status, such as believing it to be wrong when it is in fact permissible or believing it to be required when it is in fact merely permissible, or believing it to be merely permissible when it is in fact super erogatory. Or you could make a mistake about a feature of your action besides its deontic status, like whether it's fair or honest or demeaning or insensitive or generous or sanctimonious and so on, all the thick things. Or you could make a mistake about whether somebody else's action has any of these features rather than an action that you perform. Or you could make a mistake about whether a merely possible action has any of these features rather than an action that anyone actually performs. And the broad generalized false view entails that all of these other varieties of moral mistake are themselves blameworthy, provided that the agent is aware of the morally relevant non-moral facts that explain why the relevant action has the relevant property. That's a very strong view, and that I will now argue is very implausible. Okay, so to start, I'm gonna be crystal clear about what I mean by moral mistake. I think a mistake is when someone thinks that a fact obtains, but it doesn't. And a moral mistake is a fact, sorry, sorry, a mistake about a moral fact, a fact with moral content, that is some kind of deontic or evaluative content. So for example, facts about which actions are right and which are wrong, which objects or states of affairs are good and which are bad, which reasons or duties we have, which attitudes are fitting or unfitting under which circumstances, the relative magnitude of different values, the relative strength of reasons or duties, the normative relationships between them, like defeat, lexical priority, and the extension of thick properties are all moral facts. For instance, here's a guy who grabs another person's coffee and runs out of the coffee shop. If he does this while believing that what he's doing is permissible or fair or polite or in accordance with duty or supported by the overall balance of moral reasons or supported by a reason that's not defeated in the circumstances or conducive to a better state of affairs than the alternatives or praiseworthy, then he's morally mistaken. Because those are all moral facts that he's mistaken about. But by contrast, if he believes that the stuff he's stolen is orchata, then he's not morally mistaken because facts about what's coffee and what's orchata are not moral facts. Okay, so the point of this slide is just to make you think, wow, what a lot of moral mistakes there can be. There are so many varieties of moral mistake. Let's restrict our attention for now just to one family of varieties of moral mistake. That is mistakes about the deontic status of an act that you perform. One way to be mistaken about your act's deontic status is to take it to be permissible when it is in fact wrong. But that's far from the only way to be mistaken about your actions deontic status, because I'm going to assume an act can be wrong, merely permissible, required, or supererogatory, and you can take it to have any of those four statuses, and that yields 16 options, in four of which you're correct. The other 12 are varieties of moral mistake, as shown here in this table. Now, the existing literature focuses to a large extent on variety one, really it's wrong, you think it's permissible, and to a lesser extent on variety two, really it's wrong, you think it's required. But that leaves 10 other ways of being mistaken about your actions to status that have gone more or less completely ignored. And it's super implausible that these varieties of our own mistake are all themselves blameworthy, so I will now argue. For example, consider Heidi. During a genocide, Heidi goes to great lengths to hide members of the targeted racial group in her house and then smuggle them to safety. She saves hundreds of lives by doing this and also incurs massive personal risks since if her activities are discovered, then she and all her family will be killed. But later, when she's celebrated as a hero, 
Heidi demurs, saying that she just did what anybody in her position would have done. Or maybe she says she was just doing her duty, or maybe she says she was just doing the right thing. As in fact, many people who perform actions like this do seem to say when they're celebrated afterwards. Here's another example. This is Adam. Adam is a very conscientious hedonist, actualist, act utilitarian. So he thinks that most of the time, what he really should be doing is selling all his belongings and using the money to buy a malaria net. Maybe he's redone his calculations for COVID, but at least that's what he thought before. Nonetheless, he can't actually bring himself to do this. He's a cratic. So he's convinced that almost everything he does is technically morally wrong. Nonetheless, Adam regularly goes far out of his way to benefit others around him in minor respects. And in everyday interactions, he's extremely fastidious about always being polite and kind. So he berates himself for not having the guts to do more, but he still comforts himself with the thought that he at least tries to bring about small net improvements in the world each day and takes care to minimize the harm that he causes. Third example, final one for this section, consider Michaela. Michaela goes to the first meeting of a salsa class at her local community college, likes it, gets along well with the instructors, appreciates their decision to volunteer their time. And she then feels obligated to continue attending the class for the rest of the semester, despite the fact that it will continue to run just fine, even if she drops out. Okay, and it feels this way because she knows that these sorts of classes go best when they have a cohort of regular attendees. And she feels committed to being one of those attendees by dint of having gone to and enjoyed the first class. Okay, so what's going on in these cases? Heidi does something that is in fact supererogatory, I'm assuming, while believing either that it's required or that it's merely permissible. And to emphasize, this isn't a far-fetched case. On the contrary, the literature on supererogation is full of cases like Heidi's, in which people do what seem to us to be heroic things that are inclined to meet praise with demurals. As far as I'm aware though, nobody in the supererogation literature argues that these agents are blameworthy for being mistaken about their actions to Arctic statuses. On the contrary, their underestimation of their axiomatic statuses is widely regarded as a form of modesty that is at worst morally neutral and that might even be praiseworthy. Now back to Adam. Adam does something that is in fact either permissible, required or supererogatory, depending on what it is that he does, while believing that it's wrong because it isn't selling all his belongings and using the money to buy malaria nets. But his moral mistake doesn't seem blameworthy either. On the contrary, this is based on a real example. Maybe you also know some people who are a bit like this. When I think of the person I know who most closely resembles this case, I gather that most of his friends just find it touching and rather sweet that he berates himself so much while in fact being so good. For instance, when the person I know who Adam is based off of buys his colleague a coffee and brings it to their meeting because he knows that the colleague has a full day and here's a small, neat, easy way that he can uh, increase the colleague's well-being, his beneficiary's reaction is rarely to think that he's blameworthy for believing that what he's doing is not good enough. And again, this case is not that far-fetched. I mean, there aren't that many super conscientious hedonist, naturalist, utilitarians. But in general, when we talk to friends who are worried about offending or upsetting or otherwise wronging someone, but we think that what they did was fine, our reaction is usually to reassure them and not usually to judge them blameworthy for their moral mistake. That seems like kind of harsh thing to do. Okay, lastly, back to Michaela. Michaela does something that is merely permissible, I'm assuming, like she just goes to a salsa class, while believing that it's required. But once again, her moral mistake doesn't seem especially blameworthy. And again, this is a fairly quotidian phenomenon. Lots of people are quick to feel obligated to contribute to collective goods or to help other people or causes with which they have only a passing involvement in virtue of that involvement when in fact what's at stake isn't even really sufficiently important for their behavior to count as supererogatory rather than just permissible. Now, I think the fact that such people think that the importance of what's at stake and their level of involvement with it are jointly sufficient to generate a moral requirement 
might strike us as a bit sentimental uh, or a bit silly, but it again seems more touching than blameworthy. Okay, so I think these cases refute the false view. They show that it's not right because these agents are fully aware of all of the morally significant non-moral facts about their actions. And they draw the wrong conclusions only because they incorrectly estimate the moral significance of these facts. So Heidi, I'm assuming, knows all of the non-moral facts that explain why what she's doing is supererogatory. She's fully aware of what she's doing and of the risks involved. She fails to draw the conclusion that it's supererogatory. But as we just saw, that doesn't seem blameworthy and might seem praiseworthy. Similarly, Adam understands exactly what he's doing when he brings about small net improvements in the world. And he fails to appreciate the moral significance of these non-moral facts only because he's in the grip of what I'm assuming is a false moral theory. And yet his self-deprecation doesn't seem blameworthy either. Same goes for Michaela. She fails to correctly estimate the moral significance of the facts about her relationship to the salsa class and its instructors of which she's well aware. But again, that sort of mistake just seems sweetly conscientious rather than blameworthy. And it's not super hard to come up with cases like this, is your bus stop recipe. Happily, people who hold themselves to a fairly high moral standard, at least sometimes, are all over the place. And many such people are frequently mistaken about their actions, deontic statuses, because they see, I'm doing a scare quotes, they see requirements and prohibitions when in reality there are none. But these sorts of people don't need to be out of touch with moral reality. That's not the sort of thing you say about them. In cases like the sort of ones I've just talked about, the considerations to which the agents are sensitive really are morally significant. And it doesn't look as though they're undersensitive to those considerations. On the contrary, if anything, they seem oversensitive to them. OK, so that's it for the false view. That view is done now. Let's consider a modification to the false view that might seem quite natural in light of what I've said about those counter examples. OK, so here's a second false view, it's just a modification. Second false view says, it's always blameworthy to underestimate the moral significance of morally relevant non-moral features of an action that one's considering, and thus to come to have false moral beliefs. But overestimating is okay. So it's the same as the earlier view, it's just that we've now distinguished overestimating from underestimating of features moral significance. And my sense is that the philosophers who were attracted to this sort of background picture of morally significant things calling out to us to intellectually appreciate their significance might be happy with a retreat to this view. Because on this view, the morally significant things still do kind of call out to us to appreciate their significance, but just a bit more chill about it than they were on the first false view. They require that we don't underestimate them, but they're all right without overestimating them. Okay, I think it's not going to be that simple. Firstly, because it's not clear to me that the distinction between overestimating and underestimating the moral significance of a set of facts on which this view relies can be spelled out coherently. So for instance, consider any classic sort of line drawing case in which there's two or more morally significant considerations that are at stake and that conflict and suppose that the agent is mistaken about her actions moral status because she's mistaken about the relative importance of these two considerations. Question, does this agent overestimate the in fact less important thing or does she underestimate the in fact more important thing? The answer is unclear and there may be no fact of the matter. Here's another sort of example. Consider someone who believes that certain considerations render her actions supererogatory when in fact they render it required. Question, does this person overestimate or underestimate the relevant set of considerations? Well, it's not clear. On the one hand, supererogatory actions are usually morally better the required actions as captured by the popular refrain that supererogation involves going above and beyond the call of duty. So this agent's mistake looks like an overestimation in one sense. But on the other hand, supererogatory actions are permissible, not required. 
And one might think that it's a special sort of moral significance to be able to render a certain course of action required as opposed to just good or perhaps very good to do. So this mistake also looks like an underestimation since it misses a crucial aspect of the non-moral considerations moral significance. And it's again unclear whether this sort of mistake should be seen as an over or an underestimation overall. So because of cases like this, I'm not sure whether the overestimating, underestimating distinction can really be spelled out coherently. But don't worry about that because uh, if the view is coherent, it's almost certainly also false. <laughs> That's what I called it, the second false view. Perhaps the easiest way to see this is to examine moral mistakes that people make about the actions of other people rather than about their own actions. This is going to seem familiar. Consider Hector. He learns that during a genocide, some people went to great lengths to hide members of the targeted racial group in their houses and then smuggle them to safety, incurring massive personal risks and saving hundreds of lives in so doing. But when these people are celebrated as heroes, Hector frowns, shrugs, and says, oh, they just did what anybody in their position would have done. Now consider Anushka. Anushka is a conscientious hedonist, actualist, act utilitarian. And she thinks that almost everything the people do around her is morally wrong, because technically she thinks what they really should be doing most of the time is selling all their belongings and using their money to buy valerian at. Now, sometimes Anushka's friends go out of their way to benefit her in minor respects, like by bringing her a coffee when she has a full day or being polite and kind in their interactions with her. And she's polite in return because, you know, why would she make the world net worse? But she privately reminds herself that what they're doing is wrong. Lastly, consider Judy. Judy learns that her neighbour, Michaela, went to the first meeting of a salsa class at the local community college liked it, got along with the instructors, and appreciated their decision to volunteer their time. And Judy then forms the belief that Michaela is now obligated to continue attending the class for the rest of the semester, despite the fact that the class will run just fine even if Michaela drops out. And Judy thinks that because she knows that these sorts of classes only run well if they have regular attendees, and she feels that Michaela has committed to being one of those attendees by dint of having gone to and enjoyed the first class. Okay, so obviously these cases are directly analogous to the previous three cases. And that means then that if Heidi, Adam and Michaela's mistakes constitute underestimations of the relevant set of considerations, then so do Ekthor, Anushka and Judy's mistakes. And likewise, if Heidi, Adam and Michaela's mistakes, which one did I not say? If they're un overestimations, the other, you know, <laughs> If the first three mistakes are underestimations, so are the second three. If the first three mistakes are overestimations, so are the second three. That's because the pairs of agents in these cases each make the exact same mistake. Heidi and Hector believe the same false propositions, namely that Heidi just did what anybody in her position would have done, and so that her action is either required or merely permissible, but not supererogatory. And likewise for Adam and Anushka, and for Michaela and Judy. This means then that the second false view predicts that the moral mistakes of the agents in each pair should be blameworthy to the same degree. And that just doesn't seem right. The agents who are mistaken about others' actions seem much worse than those who are mistaken about their own actions. Just to go through them in turn, it's easy to see Heidi's mistake as a form of modesty, but Ekdor's mistake can't be seen that way because you can't be modest about other people's actions. And instead, Ekdor just ends up seeming like kind of an asshole. Something similar but less extreme seems true of Anushka. While Adam's tendency to be harsh on himself might be touching, Anushka's tendency to be harsh on others, like Hector's dismissive reaction to heroism, seems kind of unappreciative of the good that those other people are doing and of the recognition that they thereby deserve. Moreover, since some of the good actions that Anushka dismisses are favours done for her by her friends, her harshness sometimes seems like a form of ingratitude that might even be blameworthy. And lastly, while it seemed okay for Michaela to take herself to be obligated to keep going to the salsa class, when in fact she's under no such obligation, Judy's mistake looks excessively judgmental. 
So it looks as though Michaela's oversensitivity to the morally significant considerations at stake in her circumstances is much better than Judy's oversensitivity to the morally significant considerations at stake in Michaela's circumstances. And this despite the fact that Judy and Michaela's beliefs are about the exact same considerations and circumstances, and we can just stipulate that they're oversensitive or under whatever it is to an exactly equal degree. So that's kind of an interesting, puzzling asymmetry. And of course, there are all sorts of cool, interesting potential explanations for it. Like maybe Hector, Anushka and Judy lack the standing to blame Heidi, Adam and Michaela, while those agents have the standing to blame themselves. Or maybe there's an asymmetry in the amount of evidence that you need to form a justified negative belief about someone else as opposed to yourself such that the first three agents have justified beliefs, but the second three have unjustified ones. Or perhaps there are just brute moral requirements to the effect that we should be more lenient in evaluating other people than we are in evaluating ourselves. I think these are all interesting proposals that are worth investigating, and I investigate some of them in other work. But note that all of these explanations work by just conceding that the second false view, the one that says uh, underestimating is blameworthy, but overestimating is okay, is indeed false, or is at least not what's doing the work here. And looking elsewhere for an explanation of our intuitions about the cases. So much for the second false view. Time for the more interesting fourth and final part of the talk. Okay, so I think that the sorts of cases that I've discussed today put pressure not only on the false view and the second false view as I have formulated them, but also on the sort of background picture that I mentioned of morally significant things calling out to us to intellectually appreciate their significance. Now, of course, it's not clear what the metaphor of calling out to us could mean. Um, some of what we might think are morally significant things like uh, justice and honesty don't have mouths and <laughs> many of the morally significant things that do have mouths like people obviously aren't yelling appreciate my significance so clearly this calling out thing is a metaphor and you know it's not clear exactly what it amounts to but uh, more pressingly the sorts of cases that i've discussed today suggests that if there is some sense in which the morally significant things call out to us to appreciate their significance, they issue that call somewhat selectively. And weirdly, they issue the call not to the agents who are performing the actions to which they're relevant, but just to those who are watching the actions from the sidelines. That's weird, like why would they do that? <laughs> maybe they don't do that. That is to say, maybe a certain way of thinking about moral mistakes, moral significance, the calling out to us picture that suggests that incorrect appraisal is in general blameworthy, maybe that way of thinking has enjoyed undue popularity thanks to our selective focus on just a couple of varieties of moral mistake. That is, thinking what you're doing is permissible or required when it is in fact wrong. So maybe we should go back to the drawing board. And at a minimum, I think the true view of moral mistakes, moral significance should accommodate the intuitive data that we just observed, that certain ways of inaccurately estimating the moral significance of morally relevant considerations seem not to be blameworthy and perhaps even to be praiseworthy as laudable forms of modesty or conscientiousness, but only if it's the agent's own actions that are the subject of their beliefs rather than the actions of other people. So there's that kind of puzzling asymmetry that I just mentioned. That is to say then, I think careful reflection on further varieties of moral mistake reveals that the simple approach that looked good when we just looked at mistakes about wrongness um, can't accommodate these more complex phenomena. And so we can maybe refine our understanding of moral mistakes, moral significance by paying closer attention to the many varieties of moral mistake. Here are some more things to think about when doing so. People can make mistakes about merely possible actions rather than actions that anyone actually performs. And some of these mistakes about merely possible actions seem way more blameworthy than others, at least to me. For example, here's Frankie. 
Frankie is in an intro ethics class and he's considering the latest bizarro estimation of the trolley problem. Sorry, estimation, the latest bizarro iteration, that's the word, of the trolley problem. <laughs> so he forms a belief about whether it's permissible to flip the switch in this bizarro iteration of the trolley problem and he gets it wrong. Seems innocuous. Now Frankie goes to his history class and he learns about a medieval torture instrument that was designed but never built and never used. And Frankie forms the belief that were somebody to be tortured using this instrument, that would be morally permissible. Whoa there, Frankie, this mistake seems much more morally suspect. And it seems much more morally suspect, despite the fact that nobody has ever tortured anyone using this instrument and nobody ever will, just like nobody's ever faced this particular bizarro iteration of the trolley problem and nobody ever will, I'm assuming. So here then, Frankie makes two mistakes about the moral significance of the morally relevant non-moral features of merely possible actions. And yet one of these mistakes seems intuitively to be a, a much better candidate being something that is itself morally blameworthy. It's sort of unclear what the morally significant things call out to us to appreciate them picture implies about mistakes about merely possible actions. And that's because um, what it implies depends on the existence and persistence conditions of the actual morally significant things. So here I'm thinking, if the morally significant things call out to us to intellectually appreciate their significance whenever they're present, a salient question is when exactly are these things present? And in particular, when we form beliefs about the moral features of merely possible actions and we get it wrong, have we failed to appreciate the significance of things that are actually morally significant or only counterfactually morally significant? And this question is a bit hard in part because of the sheer variety of merely possible actions that we might consider. Because we do sometimes assess the moral features of actions in thought experiments like the trolley problem and in works of fiction. But we also often form beliefs about the moral features of actions that are just salient alternatives to those that we or others actually performed. We think things like, oh, if she'd warned you, it would have been OK. Or, well, if they'd voiced their opinion, it would have created a hostile environment. Or it would have been nice if he'd said thank you. And my inchoate sense is that these kinds of moral mistakes are about possibilities that are close enough to the actual world to concern the actually morally significant things. Whereas that might not be true, say, of mistakes about the latest bizarro iteration of the trolley problem. But I don't have to spell that out clearly and precisely. So I'm mentioning this only in order to highlight an interesting potential direction for future research. If there's any grad students out there looking for a research program, I invite you to join me. We should also think more about the moral status of what we might call immediate moral mistakes. So to see what I mean, suppose that someone knows full well that she's treating someone in a certain non-morally specified way. And suppose she also knows that treating people unfairly is wrong, but suppose she fails to appreciate that her action is wrong still because she fails to appreciate that this way of treating people that she's engaging in is unfair. She mistakenly believes that this way of treating people is perfectly fair, like the coffee stealing guy, for instance. That's an immediate moral mistake about a positive uh, deontic status of one's own action. There can also be immediate moral mistakes about the wrongness of one's own actions, like a version of the Adam example in which Adam mistakenly takes his permissible action to be wrong because he regards it as a cowardly, lazy shirking of his very demanding obligations. And there can be immediate moral mistakes about the deontic statuses of other people's actions, like if Judy takes Michaela's permissible action to be required because she thinks that its omission would be unduly selfish. Or immediate moral mistakes about the deontic status of merely possible actions, uh, like if maybe Frankie mistakenly takes using the torture device to be permissible because he takes it to be ingenious or something. That would be a weird view, but <laughs> it's a view that he could have when it would constitute immediate moral mistake as I'm using the term. It's also a bit unclear what the whole morally significant things call out to us to appreciate them view implies about these immediate moral mistakes. And it's unclear because it's unclear what that view should say about uh, which features of actions are the morally significant ones. 
So the question is, is it the non-moral facts about how an agent treats someone that are morally significant? Or is it the facts about fairness, laziness, selfishness, and so on, about what constitutes them and also about their grounding, the deontic statuses of the actions, or all of the above, or some mix? My suspicion is that proponents of this kind of view will favour the first option, holding that we're blameworthy if we fail to correctly appraise the unfairness, the conscientiousness, the sanctimoniousness, the insensitivity, and so on of what we're doing, even if we do understand that unfairness is bad and conscientiousness is good and so on. But saying that would significantly multiply the number and variety of correct moral beliefs about our actions that we have to have in order to avoid blameworthiness. And consequently, I think, saying this would significantly multiply the number and variety of moral concepts that we have to have in order to avoid blameworthiness. So whether that can be spelt out in a plausible way remains to be seen. Again, another interesting potential direction for future research. Okay, lots of interesting further stuff to think about. In the final five or so minutes, I'm gonna tell you the rough gist of a positive view that I've defended in another paper. I can't tell you much more than a rough gist because the view isn't much more than a rough gist. It's not very well developed, it's quite vague and so I'm not fully happy with it yet, but I'm assuming that some people are gonna be sitting there going like, oh, but tell us how you really feel. So um, I'll do that. So to see my view, let's go back to Harmon's view for a minute. Harmon, remember, says that moral beliefs like actions are blameworthy when they involve someone's failing to care adequately about what matters morally. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that involve here might mean result from, in which case I think, sure, sounds good. Harmon also thinks, remember, that believing that an action is morally wrong on the basis of the features that make it wrong is a way of caring about those features. And the generalized version of this view, remember, is the view that correctly appraising the moral significance of non-moral features of which one is aware is a way of caring about those features. I'm actually a bit suspicious of this claim, <clears throat> excuse me, because I think that caring is a conative state, believing is a cognitive state, and cognitive states aren't conative states. But for now, let's just grant it. Now here's the big point of contention. Harmon also says, remember, that believing that one's wrong action is morally required involves caring inadequately about the features of one's action that make it morally wrong, and so is blameworthy. And the generalized version of this view, remember, is just the first false view, that it's always morally blameworthy to fail to appreciate the moral significance of non-moral features of an action that one's considering, and to incorrectly appraise those features. It's just that there's a bit of an addition. The addition is uh, incorrect appraisals are always morally blameworthy because they involve caring inadequately about the features that one incorrectly appraises. Here I think, whoa, no, definitely no. <laughs> and I think that because I think whatever exactly is involved in adequate caring, it surely can't be that adequate caring requires moral omniscience. So even if believing is a way of caring, surely caring adequately isn't caring maximally. Or in other words, surely you can meet the standards for adequate caring without doing absolutely everything that could possibly involve or manifest caring. And in particular, surely you can care adequately about something without figuring out all of the moral proofs that it partially explains. By extension, surely you can care adequately about everything that is in fact morally significant without figuring out all of the moral proofs that they partially explain, including all those pertaining to actions that you're considering. Okay, so uh, in a nutshell, here's what I really think. I think, sure, the moral mistakes that are blameworthy could just be those that reveal a failure to care adequately about what is in fact morally significant, just a standard application of the quality of will for you to moral mistakes. 
that's definitely not all moral mistakes. And it's definitely not all of the ones that aren't based on non-moral ignorance, but rather based on an incorrect appraisal of the moral significance of normal features of which we're aware. Because even some of those incorrect appraisal type mistakes are caused not by inadequate caring, but by lack of time, lack of training, lack of cognitive resources, tiredness, <laughs> and so on. Maybe there are some moral mistakes that are such that anyone who cared adequately about everything that is in fact morally significant wouldn't make them. And those then will be the moral mistakes that are blameworthy whenever they are in fact made, since they reveal that the agent who makes them cares inadequately. So in order to figure out how many and which varieties of moral mistake fall in this category, we need to roll up our sleeves and do the hard work of figuring out the content of what I like to call the standards for adequate caring, the standards that tell us what it is to care adequately about everything that is in fact morally significant. I think it's only once we've ascertained the content of those standards that we can figure out how many and which varieties of moral mistake are consistent with meeting the standards for adequate caring and thus not blameworthy and how many and which varieties of moral mistake reveal the agents who have fallen short of the standards for adequate caring and thus to be blameworthy. And that's it, the end, thanks for watching. <laughs>